What's up guys, Sarah Winstead here, bikini athlete and coach for Pro Physique. And today I'm coming at you with a contest prep Q&A. So I put a question box on my Instagram, asked you guys to send me some questions. I've got a lot of great questions, so I'm gonna go through them. Obviously I have my computer over here to make sure I don't miss anything, uh, but let's dive right in. So one of the first questions I got was, how do you go pro? How do you get your pro card? Now. Uh, this depends upon the federation that you're in, but I'll go over the general requirements for the NPC, which is the federation that I compete in, that most of my clients compete in. Um, first of all, you need to go to an amateur level show, local regional show in your town, in your area, that is a national qualifying show. That means you place top two in your open height class, A, B, C, D, sometimes they go further than that, depending on how big the show is. Placing top two in your open class qualifies you for the national level shows. Now, there is the MPC News Online website that has the listing of the national level shows every single year. They're pretty much, now that we're beyond the COVID times, um, they're pretty much, you know, stable as far as what time of year and the places that they're held. And so at the national shows, you need to, depending upon the show, first, sometimes first and second. Sometimes like Junior USAs, you have to win your class and place top four in the overall to get your pro card. Now, check out the national shows if you're interested in doing one because they're all a little bit different with how their pro status is achieved. Make sure you understand the rules behind that. Um, and Masters as well. Masters Nationals, and there's like, I think Universe has Masters classes and a couple other shows do as well, Masters USAs. That's a different, again, level of getting your pro card as well for 35 and over. And of course, those rules are at that show. So check the promoter's website, check the show's website for exactly what the details are of that. We also have a great episode of the Pro Physique Code, our podcast for Team Pro Physique. I'll link that episode down below. Um, they did a great job breaking down how to go pro in those areas. So next question, picking a suit. How do you pick your suit? When do you order your suit? What do you go with? Things like that. Well, typically I'll tell my clients a jewel tone, so like blues, greens, purples, um, those kinds are pretty much typically safe for a lot of competitors. I myself have a teal suit. Um, I just love the color teal. It pops really well against my skin. And a lot of companies will actually send you samples of the fabric of the suit itself, the way you can kind of hold it against your skin, maybe even put a little bit of fake tan on, um, just to see how it looks against your skin. Now, again, it's not gonna be exact because you're gonna have lighting, multiple coats of tan, things like that on, but it can give you an idea. Also, some suit companies may actually allow you to do a consult with somebody from the company that has done this with girls that knows based upon like your complexion, your hair color, um, things like that, what color may be suitable for you. And so there's some colors that you might wanna stay away from. Sometimes that is like the the yellows. The, I've seen a black suit that actually looks really good. Um, sometimes yellows or like hot pinks may not be your friend on stage because sometimes with the tan, it may look a little bit redder, um, not as much darker as far as the tan goes. But again, someone like that from those companies can really, really help you. I use Angel Competition bikinis. I'm not sponsored, um, but I've used them for my suit and I'll use them again for my upcoming suit for my competition season next year. Um, one of our fellow coaches, Lexi, I'm sure you follow her on, Inst on uh, YouTube. She's fantastic. She actually does suit consults for Angel. And so reach out to her. She's awesome. She can help you. And then, uh, if it's not her, if she's not available, there are plenty of other suit people to help you too. And I know that the other suit companies do the same thing as far as like consults are concerned. And then you can order it. They'll tell you when you need to order it. Usually I say 12, 16 weeks out, sometimes shorter time frames, depending upon how much weight we may be losing. Though They have calculations that they do behind the scenes based upon what's your height, what's your weight right now, what your anticipated weight loss is to help you and help them design the suit the way it fits you for show day. My next point, don't try on your bottoms when you get them because you're gonna break them. They're not supposed to fit you right now. 
They'll fit you during peak week. Um, I, that's usually when I try my bottoms on to make sure. Um, and also they come with little tabs of fabric on the ends to where you can have the suit taken in or let out on the bottoms by a local seamstress if you need to do that sometime, you know, the, like leading up to your show, they, that can happen. And also um, there are people back there that will glue your suit to you. It's like ripping off a band-aid. It sucks, but they can help with something that's gapping. Maybe you lose a little bit more um, in our chest than we thought, and they have a little bit of a gap up there. They'll actually glue the suit to you. They look at you. It's called glazing and gluing. It's not <laughs> glamorous, um, but they will glue the suit to you if it needs to be done. They'll glue the little tabs underneath um, the suit so that'll be all taken care of. So they do a great job back there backstage. So don't be afraid to glaze and glue. That way it doesn't move or gap or look any weird stuff on stage too. Um, and also check the suit bottoms against your federation. Now the NPC, all suit bottoms are welcome. Other natural federations or other smaller federations may have rules around that. Check the federation, check the suit bottoms. Um, I've never had to wear my suit to check-ins. Again, I've only competed in the MPC, but I have brought it or I've had it in my room just in case people need to see it. They've never asked for it. But again, that's just me. But check your local federations for their kind of rules. All right. Another question. Regarding PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, steroids, and bikini, are they necessary? Um, what are your thoughts about them and everything? So I've gone into this a little bit before in prior videos, but um, I honestly have no issues with other people taking them. I myself have chosen not to, um, but I don't have any issues. I, it doesn't bother me either way if people take them. Um, some may be thinking they're rushing, um, maybe a little more impatient, might be rushing the process a little bit. That That's their decision. It's their personal decision to make, and that's okay. Everyone is on their own journeys. I'm not going to compare myself to people that are or aren't on them. I'm going to get up on stage and show off my hard work. That's what matters because the PEDs themselves don't do the work for you. They're not going to guarantee you a pro card or a placing or more muscle mass. No, your hard work does that. It does. It does. It's yes. It can get you there probably a little bit faster by setting you up for success. Of course, that's what they're designed to do. But if you're not putting in the work, if you're not training hard, if you're not managing your diet and managing your improvement season and utilizing all those tools at your disposal, then it's not going to matter who is on it or who's off it. You know, um, and that's my opinion. It doesn't matter. The thing I do have an issue with, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, if you know, if you aren't natural, don't claim to be natural. Like that's, I have an issue with that. If people on, on their pages and on their channels or whatever are claiming like, oh, I'm a lifetime natural and you may hear them say that they're not or that they're taking some things. It's just like, I don't like that unrealistic expectation of people setting that out there being like, that's unachievable by people that might be newer to the sport. So, and my other opinion is, hey, maybe try reaching your genetic potential first with years and years and years of training. And then if you need it after that, it's your decision go for it. You know, it's totally up to you. Meal prep tips. This is actually a good question in prep. Um, in contest prep, as we know, we're getting a little bit less energy, getting a little less food, moving a whole lot more. And so decision fatigue can be very real in contest prep. You can look in the fridge and being like, what, what, what fits my macros? What's on my plan for today? Um, this is where, again, planning ahead is key, especially in contest prep. But even taking it a step further in meal prepping, at least like proteins, at least your proteins. And maybe keeping it to like two to three sources of protein. Mine in prep were egg whites, chicken, and beef. Like I pretty much, I had like turkey in there as well on occasion when I was done with chicken. I switched that out. But then the last like four weeks of prep, it was just egg whites, beef, and chicken. Like that's literally what I ate. You guys can go back and look at my old prep videos. That's pretty much what I did. Um, as far as, and protein powder, obviously as well, but like keeping it simple allowed me to not have decision fatigue, it allowed me to know what was going on. And so I prep my meals ahead of time. I prep my beef. I buy like three pound packs of beef, prep it all up. It's done. Egg whites. I can cook in the morning, like in five minutes. So that doesn't really bother me. Chicken. I always use the Tyson frozen chicken strips. Those are easy. They're already seasoned. Throw them in the microwave. 90 seconds. We're done. Um, that's also like when you're hungry and prep, you don't want to make a meal that takes like 45 minutes to an hour to make. Like we don't have that kind of time. We got to eat. So, um, and then like having like maybe three to four fruits and vegetables you have on rotation. Like for me, it was like my strawberries. I had frozen strawberries. So I had like two servings of those. And then I had um, green beans, uh, zucchini, and then like something else I had in prep too. Um, and so I just can't remember that far back. 
<laughs> um, but yes, rotation as far as like making it easy. Frozen vegetables, real simple, real easy in the microwave. You know, I still have those in, in improvement season. Like it's just easy and convenient to have those kinds of things on hand. And then of course, easy, quick starches rice, cream of rice, rice cakes, uh, potatoes that you can microwave that are in like little saran wrap bags. Like those are easy to do when you need a meal quickly and you don't want to think about it. You know, in prep, obviously putting your meals in ahead of time, prepping your proteins ahead of time because they'll take the longest to make and then having some easy stuff on hand. Fats, they're going to be there. I had the guac cups. If you guys have seen me use those for a ton, those were like better for me than keeping avocados on hand. I have my nut butters and my cheese. Those are pretty much my staples as far as that goes. Is it boring? Yeah. <laughs> we have a goal and I don't want to be looking at my fridge trying to figure out what new recipes or new meals I'm going to be having. Inside of four weeks, nothing changed. You guys saw my foods. It didn't change. Um, and that was easy for me because I knew the grocery store was the same thing every single week that I needed to get. Made my list really easy. Made my preps for meal prepping. I'm all my proteins very easy. It was done. Like it was easy. And I spiced it up with seasonings. I used Italian seasoning and turmeric on my eggs, on my meats. It was really good Italian seasoning on my meats. I love the Kroger brand Italian seasoning. So good. Right ratio of everything. Salt and pepper. Um lemon pepper on my green beans, you know, stuff like that. It made it interesting. And I actually enjoy the flavors. Like I found stuff that I actually enjoyed in contest prep that, you know, yes, it was probably boring to eat it for a month, but I knew I had a goal in mind and that made it okay. It just, you have a goal, you have a purpose for what you're doing. You have a strong why for why you're doing it. And then it makes those kinds of things just like easy, you know, and it's fuel at that point. It's fuel. <laughs> um, all right. Diet breaks and refeeds. Why do we do them during contest prep? What is the purpose of them? Why are they beneficial in contest prep? Love a refeed. We'll start with that and then we'll go into diet breaks because they're pretty much one leads to the other. We start with refeeds. Now, why do we do these? Well, in contest prep, like I said, we're cutting calories, we're increasing cardio in phases. And at a certain point, you know, we are, we are pulling this rubber band. We are pushing this body to the nth degree. We can't keep hacking and hacking and hacking and hacking and hacking away all the way to show day. We won't look good. We won't feel good. There's no relief from the rigors of contest prep. It's hard. It's very hard. Um, but the body is going to fight back at some point. It's going to get inflamed. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about like joint inflammation. I'm talking about inflammation from a standpoint of like stress, Dieting is a stressor. Cardio is a stressor. You have outside life stressors that you need to manage and things like that. And the refeeds allow the body a temporary break um, from the rigors of dieting. Now, how do we do this? It is a strategic planned increase of usually carbohydrates, sometimes a little bit of fat too, to help th things like digestion. Um, but it's a planned day. You just start with one, six low days and one refeed day. Um, usually it's about 100, 200 calories worth of, you know, depending on the person and what they're, what they're going on, what they have, um, ish calories of through carbohydrates. And so it is the same food you're eating. So simply, let's say if you're, I remember I did a lot of rice cakes on these days <laughs> to where it's like, I went from two rice cakes to like, five rice cakes or something like that at one meal. Then I might have a little bit more rice later in my last meal or something like that as well. It's already what you're consuming. We're not introducing new foods. This is not a free for all. This is a planned intentional day that you have higher carbohydrates. So um, start with one day, we test it out. Get on the scale the next day. Weight can go up, weight can go down, weight can be stable. Data points for us. This also informs what our peaking strategy is going to be as well, um, because that could be the goal that we might get to during a peak week when we do linearly progressive load in carbohydrates during peak week. Um, and so all data points. Sometimes my clients drop, sometimes my clients get, sometimes they gain a little bit. Why do you gain? Well, carbs stored in the muscles fluff up with the water for every gram of carbs that you eat your body stores three to four grams of water and so that could just be a water fluctuation but you look better you feel better and your lifts are amazing um the pumps is incredible after a refeed day when to take them i usually like starting you know again it depends on the client and what they do but i found for me personally upper body day on that day when i train legs the next day because it takes about 24 hours or so for carbs to assimilate in the body and so when i have the day before my leg day the next day is like fucking fire. Um, 
it's amazing. It's so, so good. And so I know that I can make it through that, maybe like try to really, really push my body at that point and see what I can do in that leg session. And then I go get cardio done and everything like that. By the end of the day, I'm just like, did I even have a refeed day? <laughs> Hunger may spike. You might be more hungry after the day as well, just because we're having more food. Um, but that is also why, you know, we, we push and we pull back. We push and we pull back. That's where, hey, if one goes well, let's try two. Let's try three. You know, especially towards the end of prep, like even like in between shows as well. These can be very beneficial. We're trying to get those last few pounds off of like having like three push days and like three refeed days. It's it helps you through those three push days where you're just like, let's fucking go knowing that you're going to have three refeeds after that or at least two refeeds after that. And then you're going to check in with your coach and see how you're feeling. Um there's a lot of communication with my clients in the weeks leading up to when we're especially when we're doing these these pushes. I just want to know that you guys are okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Then occasionally we'll take a diet break. Maybe once in a prep, maybe twice in a prep. It depends on how long the prep is and how deep. If you're only been dieting for three weeks, you don't need a refeed. You don't need a diet break. You need to keep pushing. I'm talking like weeks. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there. We've been dieting for long enough. We need that break. Um, that is a same numbers, usually around your refeed numbers, depending upon if we've done them yet. Um, half the cardio and it's for a full week. It's very scary. I've done it before. It's very scary because <laughs> you're just like, how oh, is this going to help? It's going to help. You're going to feel better. You're going to move better. You're going to start fidgeting more. You're going to have more energy. Your lifts are going to be like out of control. Um, you're it's just like, you're just going to feel like a normal human or at least, you know, suboptimal to like ish human status for like a week. And you're just like, ah, this is what life feels like. Um, and it's great. It's wonderful. Um, and your body feels better. Inflammation normally goes down. Weight is either stable or it drops. Um, I've not really had too many clients gain weight during a diet break. And usually if it is, it's again, you'll look tighter you look better it's from all the water and the carbohydrates your body's storing and you look better and you're just like balls to the wall pushing in your workouts um so yes inflammation cortisol all those stress drops it helps it helps a lot so um yeah so that's refeeds and diet breaks going into the purpose of a reverse diet um, I've done videos on my reverse diets. So you guys can check those out as well. But in in like, you know, miniature fashion, it helps with post-show, helps post-show blues, helps have a plan. What have you been doing all of contest prep? You had a plan. Every single week you had a plan. Why is post-show any different? We want to gain some weight, but we don't want to gain 15 pounds in a week. No, we don't want to have us to go off the rails and when our hunger is at its highest and our body is at its most sponge-like to like absorb all the body fat very quickly, we want to have a plan, okay? Usually I'll start clients off with a diet break at our Friday show numbers before the show on Saturday, typically, depending upon the person and what they're doing. We do a full diet break of that week, then we come back, see how we're feeling, we go up from there. It's a great time, but keep your foods the same, especially in the two to three weeks post-show, get us out of that hole. Okay, that's why I tell my clients, let's get us out of this hole, let's get you feeling better, get you more energy, but keep your foods the same. You are very mentally fatigued during this point of contest prep because you're done. There's no more like looming show date. There's no more like, I need to be leaner, I need to do this, I need to do that. No, it's, it's a, it can be a free-for-all and you can do some damage to yourself post-show if you don't do this right. Um, I, it hasn't happened to any of my clients, but I can see it happen. You've heard the horror stories of people gaining 15 pounds in a week post-show because they didn't have a plan and they just went home and they kept the damn frozen treats in their freezer and they ate them all in one day or they ate five pizzas in one day because they were just so freaking hungry they didn't have a plan and they just don't know what to do. And so strategic increases to your calories, starting at like your refeed or your post-show numbers, whatever those are, and then we make slow increases. And about three weeks after your show, then yes, Work in a different food. Work in a fun food. Work in a food that you know you can control. For me, the first one I worked in was bread. I was like, I want my English muffins back, damn it. <laughs> I was like, that was the first thing. Um, because I knew that that was a portion thing for me. Is like I could take out one English muffin and I wouldn't have a fear or a mental like moment of being like, can I 
had the cereal without going over because cereal for me back then was a big trigger as far as just like, I want all the cinnamon toast crunch. <laughs> One serving was very sad. And so I was just like, you know, so it, it's, it's managing the cravings, managing the hunger. Cause you will be very, very hungry post-show in those opening weeks because your hunger is like all over the place. Once we get out of the hole, as I call it, the first three weeks or so, we're usually in the clear as far as like any sort of like overconsumption or binging events. You still feel the pull of it. I still felt the pull of it, you know, four or five, six weeks after, but it was less. It was more like I could manage it. I could recognize it when I felt it. And then I could choose to redirect it. Or I could be like, yes, I have room in my macronutrients for a cookie or a brownie. And I knew I could keep it at one because I was already eating a decent amount of food by that point. I wasn't on sad calories or anything like that. So that's what I recommend for reverse dieting. Usually we're adding 40 to 80 calories every few weeks. Make sure the body is stable. Again, this depends upon the client and their journey and who they are and making sure you check in post-show. Check in post-show. <laughs> um, and it usually eight to 12 weeks or so. And then you're like up to a new maintenance kind of range. You're a damn athlete in the gym. You're balls to the wall training. All those things. You're feeling good. We're working in maybe an untracked meal here or there. Date nights are back. Things like that where you feel like a normal human again. And you're just like, ah, this is life. Then we're, then we're getting back to our bases. We're getting back to enjoying ourselves in the gym. So... And the re other reason why I say keep your food the same in the opening weeks post-show, digestion digestion. Dig what have you been doing? The like I said, I just said five minutes ago, I kept my foods the exact same the last four weeks before contest, before uh, my show for digestion purposes. And then, you know, you can't throw a bunch of food at yourself, like a bunch of new foods at yourself post-show because like your digestion is going to get real wonky. Um, and so keep them the same, add those things in slowly and you totally, totally got this. You're going to feel better. You're going to feel better. All right. What to do when digestion slows down during prep? So that is the kind of harkens back to what I just said as well. Um, keeping your foods the same, relatively similar foods, maybe changing out a vegetable, changing out a fruit, changing a protein source, very rarely, but keeping your foods simple, okay? Um, if you're having like protein bars close to show, I would say maybe take those out if you think that those are causing the issue. Um, if you're having a lot of like Walden Farms, People I know lather, slather their, I don't think as much anymore, but I think they used to slather their pancakes or their protein pancakes. I was like, maybe those things need to be simpler. Maybe you're being affected because as we get leaner, we get affected more so by the little things like artificial sugars. Like I still had them in because I had them in my coffee. I had my Jordan Skinny Herbs in my coffee every single day. That was pretty much the only artificial thing that I had um, other than my protein powder, which yes, has some, some other things in there like sucralose and things like that. But we get more sensitive. And so it may just be, hey, we need to keep our food a little bit simpler or take out maybe a protein bar in favor of more vegetables that are going to be more fibrous than a protein bar would. Because yes, as carbs drop, fiber is naturally going to drop as well. And so mitigating that as best we can by keeping the fiber number as high as we can. Um, obviously, water consumption plays a role in it as well. But then also, Sometimes when we get the refeeds, our digestion gets a little bit better because we have more carbs and fats. We have more volume in our stomach and everything just kind of moves smoother. Um, speaking of that, you can also use things like smooth move teas or magnesium supplementation as well to help that in that area. Stress and sleep, they need to be managed as well because that's gonna also contribute to poor digestion too. So if you're stressing out, a ton, um, you know, we're, again, I said it before, we're already stressed out during prep through what we're doing to our bodies. We don't need to be adding in, it's hard. We don't need to be adding in more stressors onto ourselves, so. But it is gonna happen at some point. Digestion is gonna slow down just because again, we're taking in less food, less food volume, and our digestion is naturally gonna slow down a little bit. But if anything you can do to help that, like I mentioned, you know, fruits and vegetables, fibrous foods, water intake, um, you know, maybe cutting out or cutting down on the artificials um, can be helpful from that kind of a standpoint. So let's see. Um, hiking and other classes and cardio styles during prep. I'm okay with one-offs like that. Um, however, some of my clients do enjoy like Peloton as far as like the classes are concerned. I'm good with that as long as you can commit to it, as long as we can track it and keep it similar every single week. That way when we need to make an adjustment, it's an easy change of like, okay, instead of an easy ride, I'm going to go for the moderate rides now for heart rate intensity, for timing that we need to be able to increase. We just need to be able to make these moderate increases to cardio either through time or intensity during contest prep. And so 
so if you can commit to it i'm good with that but occasionally yes my husband and i would go to hike kennesaw mountain um on the weekend and it would be like a four to five mile hike that i would just one off do and yes it, it's you know, your body's not going to be that quickly adapted to something like that but if we want to utilize a different cardio style like i was a swimmer so it's like if i ever wanted to get back in the water hint i don't um not for that purposes um but if I were to do that as your cardio, then that's great. Again, we can manipulate time, we can manipulate intensity through those kinds of means for the purposes of contest prep. All right, last few here. Red flags during prep and check-ins. Um, number one, missing check-ins. Don't miss a prep check-in. Um, text or email your coach to tell them you're gonna miss or give me an update, a brief thing, be like, hey, shit's at the fan with my family, I, I, I gotta take my kids or dog or whatever it is, stuff's going on and I can't check in this week. Understandable, that's totally fine, just let me know. I worry about you guys during contest because I know what we're doing and so don't miss check-ins, don't miss check-ins. The check-in that you don't wanna do is the one that you need to do. Um, other red flags are like saying you're a 10 out of 10 on adherence to your cardio and your macros, but maybe our weight's up like two to three pounds and you're not really reporting issues with stress or cycle or sleep issues. Then I wonder about our adherence. You know, I, I don't want us, I don't want our actions to be mismatched from our words. If we're going to commit to something and we have adherence issues, another red flag, um, then we need to have a conversation about, you know, are we serious about this? Do we really want this? We say we want it, but do our actions line up with what we're saying? That has to happen. Um, I wouldn't say it was a red flag during my own contest prep, but I knew when I was done. I knew. I knew it. Um, when I was just being like, Junior Nationals is my last show. Like, I think it was like my, my most down in the dumps check in to my coach Paul. Um he called me. He was like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "I'm good. I'm just fucking done, dude." <laughs> um that was like the, it wasn't a red flag. It was not a red flag to him because all of a sudden like I'm, you know, I'm usually pretty, you know, just like let's freaking go in my check-ins of being like, "Yes, it's not working or like we're going to keep pushing. Let's fucking go. I'm fine." But that one I was just like, "This is not fine." <laughs> This is not fine. And I was honest. So be honest. This is not a red flag. But be honest with your coach. Because that happened. And I was just like, I'm I'm done after Junior Nationals. Like, I'm not going to Masters Nationals this year. Like, it, I'm just fucking done. So, but you know when you get to that point and you need to be honest with your coach about that kind of stuff. Like, when that stuff happens, you need to tell us. Because that, again, it's not really a red flag, but it's a flag of being like, okay, like, got it. Message received. We need to push and then we need to have a plan to get you out of this and get you feeling better. Stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was hilarious, actually. I was just like, Paul? <laughs> I was just like, you, it's fine. I'm fine. I'm just done. So, um, green flags. So let's get to the positives. Habits are good. Mindset is good. Stress is managed. Recovery is good. Training is good as good as it can be during contest prep. Um, mindset is also a huge part of contest prep. I've done a lot of videos on this, um, especially about like in the depths of prep of like what the realities of contest prep are. Like I've done a ton of videos on that. Um, but the mindset is hopeful and positive or as positive as it can be in prep when you're feeling like dog trash and you're wondering how your legs are still moving throughout the day and you're wondering how you can sit here and film a YouTube video talking about all this stuff. <laughs> it's like sheer willpower at that point. You're just like, I'm just here. I'm just moving. We're doing it and that's it. Um, but that's, you know, but that's the check-ins in prep. That's the check-ins that I just get on the video and I'm just like, just keep going. Just keep going what you're doing it's working we're getting there and this has an end date this is not forever and we have a purpose we have a strong why all those things and so um and accepting of hunger and fatigue as just a part of your life temporary part of your life but it's a part of your life because you will be hungry you will be tired and that's just it like we can manage those i manage those very well with core burn but it's not going to go away it's not going to make you feel better it's just gonna you know make you feel like i said like you know for refeeds is like suboptimal to ish human it's like suboptimal to meh optimal <laughs> as far as that kind of stuff goes um and then of course green flags would be like having a strong why um having you know a, a, beyond a placing or a trophy a why that you can actually just latch onto when those days get hard when you feel like you don't want to go do your cardio when you don't want to meal prep your foods when you just want to sit on the couch and not move i call it my statue time to where you literally get to a point where you're just eating your food and you're just noticing like i'm not moving 
Like I'm not fidgeting. I'm not doing this. Like this is improvement season. This is, I have lots of food, but like it slows. It is wild when you start feeling that as far as like pushing, like it hurts, not hurts to move, but it's like you're pushing against like trying to move your arm and being like, this is taking so much more energy, but you look at it as like, huh, okay, this is kind of cool. But those are the green flags, the positive things. And again, not every check-in is going to be positive. Not every week is going to be positive in prep. But as long as you can find the positive or find the wins, this is why I ask my clients to find the wins every single week, even in prep, as far as like, I hit my cardio. Or I was able to go on a, another walk with my girlfriends because they wanted to go for a walk in a park and their kids wanted to play on the playground. Great. You know, stuff like that. Or like, hey, I was able to eat my food before an event and I was able to still be there for my family even though I'm three weeks out of my show. That's awesome. Like finding those positive and finding those wins is very important to latch onto those kinds of things during contest prep. Um, those are the, the, the green flags that I see. All right, last couple. How long does it take for a body to respond in contest prep? Great question. Um, one to two weeks generally, we might see like the scale creep or the waistline creep or um, just start seeing small changes in the physique and progress photos, but then sometimes it takes three. You know, every single person, excuse me, is different with how long it takes for them to respond. If we need to make a change earlier, then we'll make a change really earlier. But making sure the pillars, like I mentioned before, of like sleep and stress are managed as best that we possibly can because those things are going to impact at least that scale weight. It may not affect as much like our cycle obviously impacts like waistline, water retention there, photos, things like that. But making sure we manage those as best that we possibly can. All right. Um, worst and best parts of show day. Worst part of show day, you guys have heard this before, managing the tan. The tan sucks. It sucks. Because <laughs> you're like, I can't touch anything. I can't sit on anything. It's going to get on shit. I got to pack all this black things with me, uh, sheets and towels and, you know, even like a washcloth. Like th things you don't think about. Um, all the baggy clothes in the world, like all those kinds of things. And so um, managing the tan was probably like the worst part of show day. Um, but then the best part. It says shower afterwards. It's like number one. More than the food, more than anything else. Like it's going to, food's going to be there. But it's just that shower, man. Of being like, oh, you just stand there and you're just like, just get off of me. <laughs> I can wear deodorant. I can put on lotion now. Like I can feel like a normal, normal-ish human again. Like actually feel like a girl again. Um, That's like, you know, that's awesome. Like it, I would say, that's like 1A and 1B with like showing off your hard work on stage and being like up, standing up there, looking at the judges, looking at the crowd and being like, I fucking did this. Like I did this. This is me. This is what I got to show today. And this is a result of all of your hard work, all of your effort, not just in prep, but in improvement season as well. And that kind of goes into one of my points about, you know, I'm not competing this year. And it can be hard, you know, getting the itch and watching all the shows start to, you know, spin up and everything like that this year and not doing it this year. But I know that what I'm doing right now is going to prepare me for my goal. It's getting me closer to my goal every single day. And it's going to be there. The stage and the seasons are going to be there when, when I need to get back up there. So showing off the hard work. I would say that's probably number, I wrote shower afterwards first because that's the first thing that came to my mind. But I think it's probably showing off the hard work first. Then the shower and then the community backstage. The girls are wonderful. Being nice to the expediters. They're working hard. Um, and just everyone's so supportive backstage. Like it really, really is. Like it's just, it's an awesome community because we're all tired. We're all have this sticky ass tan on ourselves. We're all just like, okay, can we get up there yet? Is it our time yet? Our feet hurt. Every, everyone's in the same boat. And you can just like, vibe with anybody up there because we're all up there yes we are competing against each other yes we all want to win we're all competitive people of course but you know we're all we've all been through this we've all been through the shitter um and we're all up here we're just like we're doing this let's go have fun today is a day to have fun like have fun on show day like don't let it go by and be all just like man man i didn't do as well as i wanted to like just be grateful that you get to do this and that you get to get up there and show off the work. And if you're not happy with your place, you're not happy with your package, then go eat some food and do something about it. <laughs> so lift more, take the feedback, go do all the things that way you come back each and every season better. Not every year, doesn't need to be every single year, every single season you get better. So, all right. All right, this video has been long enough. So 
<laughs> Thank you everyone for all of the questions that you guys submitted. I really appreciate it. I'll do another one of these probably later on in the year, maybe more so about improvement season. But if you all have any other questions you want to see or topic ideas for future videos, please do comment below, like, subscribe, all the things, and I will catch you guys in the next video.